All right, uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our rules webinar session one. As a reminder, we will be having session two next Tuesday on April 6th from 5.30 to 7, same as today. Um, our presenter today is PGA professional Clark Lewis. Mr. Lewis is the head professional up at Valley Country Club in Sugarloaf, Pennsylvania, and he's been there since 1979. He is a member of the National Rules Committee and is the chairman of the Philadelphia PGA Section Rules Committee. Um, also joining us today is PGA Master Professional Tom Karpis. He currently works as a rules official for the PGA Tour of Champions. Prior to that, he was the head professional at Kennett Square Golf and Country Club for over 19 years. He's also a past chairman of the National Rules Committee and a past president of the Philadelphia Section. Uh, he was the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Section PGA Golf Professional of the Year in 2002. He received the National Professional Development Award in 2007, and he was induct, inducted into the Philadelphia Section Hall of Fame in 2018. Um, a couple housekeeping things just for our webinar today. As I said, uh, we will be recording, so we'll post this onto the Philadelphia Section PGA's YouTube page. Um, we ask that we uh, we ask that you all mute yourselves during the presentation, just so that we don't have any background noise going on. Uh, there is one button I want everyone to avoid hitting, if possible. This is the Present Now button down in the corner. If you don't see it, that's okay too. Um, please do not click this button, as it will interrupt the presentation later on. Um, if you have any troubleshooting issues, please put those questions into the chat feature that you'll see up at the top right hand side of your screen. Um, I'll do my best to go through those with everyone. Uh, just be aware that most of the time it, it is a connection with your Wi Fi that is causing the problem. Uh, if you have any questions for Mr. Lewis as he's presenting, please also put those questions into the chat feature and I'll prompt Mr. Lewis as needed. Um, if we have any follow-up questions, you know, you can unmute yourself then as well. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to Mr. Lewis to open this evening with the national anthem. He is our unofficial section vo vocalist. He's the voice of the Philadelphia PGA, and it's become tradition for him to open up all our section meetings this way. So, uh, Mr. Lewis, if you'd like to take it away. Thank you very much, Allison. Uh, I want to welcome everyone. and. Uh, I'm happy to sing our national anthem. This is something I always do before our presentation uh, in this great country where we can play this wonderful game that we all love. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? Thanks, Clark. Nice job. Thank you. Beautiful voice. Now, Allison, am, am I all set to go to start the presentation? Am I presenting? Um, not yet. Let's go ahead and we'll start off by going over that pre-webinar okay. quiz that we sent out okay. to everyone. Um, I'll okay. go ahead and present my screen so you can all see the questions and kind of follow along. Um, let me know if you have a problem seeing this as well. Can you all see the quiz up there? Clark, can you I see it? I can't see it, no. Do I, I can see it. You can see it, Emma. Yeah. Oh, Clark, you're probably um, you're probably on the screen with your presentation still. If you right. look at the pages at the top and go back to the Google Meet page, Google. Um, then you can view my screen as we go see. along here. Google Meet. Um, okay. 
All right. So just to kind of start off some overall uh, insights from the quiz today, our average was a 6.7. And so there were uh, two main questions that uh, a lot of you seem to miss. So Clark will make sure to go over those as we quickly go through all of them. Um, but the first one was a player whose ball is furthest from the hole is said to have the honor. And the second was, what are the five parts of the golf course? So uh, I'll go ahead and we'll start from question one and I'll let Clark kind of go through and explain those. Okay. Uh, let me go here. All right. All right. So um, the first question was, a leaf sticking to a ball is a loose impediment. Well, that's, that is going to be false because, I have to get my glasses on here. It's going to be false because... Oh. Um, a leaf definitely is a loose impediment, but not when it's sticking to a ball. We used to say adhering to the ball. Now they say sticking. So that was that that one's false. Okay. So um, my bad there. I think the question was marked as true. So all of those those of you who responded true, um, please know that that was the incorrect answer and that the correct answer to this question was false. Um, as Clark explained, if it's sticking to the ball, um, that is what kind of changes it from a loose impediment. So my apologies there. Um, we'll move on to question two here, unless someone has a question. Okay, this question says, a player whose ball is farthest from the hole is said to have the honor, and that's false. The reason for that is, uh, the, the answer to that question is he's said to be away. The honor refers to the teeing ground the teeing area before we put the ball in play. Uh, if, if you have, if you, you may have the honor on the uh, on the teeing area, but when you're farthest from the hole elsewhere, uh, it's the it, we're, we say now that you are away. Okay. All right, and we can. Um, I think we had a question from uh, Emma uh, on the first question, actually. So Emma, if you uh, want to go ahead and ask your question. Um, so what is a loose impediment? How are we saying well, you saying know, loose, loose, just, just, uh, uh, basic definitions of that loose impediments are things that are not man-made things like, uh, uh, sticks, twigs, um, some insects, uh, things like that. But, uh, but that's what a loose impediment, they're natural objects, things that are natural as opposed to obstructions which are man-made things are we uh are we good with and, that and emma uh clerk will probably i believe go further into you know loose impediments and obstructions later in the presentation as well is that correct clerk uh i might i'm not sure exactly we're, we're going to talk about penalty relief we're going to talk about relief where you have uh, where you have to pay a penalty okay. okay thank you you're welcome all right, so we can go on to question three here. Um, here we go. Emma, how old are you? <laughs> I wanted to ask Emma how old she was. Um, I am 11. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I, I've got the, you know. I... Oh, you, you, you froze car Clark. <laughs> this looks like Clark may have just froze up for a minute. Um, we'll see if he kind of refreshes here. Well, while we're waiting for him, we can go ahead and go over. I don't have the, this particular definition committed to memory, but uh, am I back? Yes, you're back. Okay. So now, uh, well, the reason I asked, uh, uh, Sto uh, uh, the definition of loose impediments, stones, loose grass, leaves, branches, sticks, things like that. Worms, insects, things like that. Okay. So an island of grass growing in a bunker is part of the bunker. And the answer to that is false. It's not part of the bunker by definition. It's so that if, you're, if your ball is on that island of grass, you can ground your club and do certain other things, but that is not considered to be part of the bunker. Okay. All right, we can go on to question four. Now, this question says a ball is lost if it is not found within three minutes. 
And that is true. If it's not now that up until a couple of years ago, you used to get five minutes, but now you get three minutes. So if the ball is not found in three minutes, it's lost and you cannot play it. You have to take a penalty, which we'll see as I as I go through my presentation today. A penalty for a law says a penalty for a lost ball is two strokes. And that answer is false. The penalty is stroke and distance. It's the stroke, a penalty stroke and the distance that you would have had with that with that stroke. So it might look like it's two strokes, but it's not two strokes. It's stroke and distance. You have to go back to where you hit your previous shot from, which I'll get into later. This question says penalty areas may be marked red or yellow, and that is true. Now this one, information on distance or rules, rules of golf, is not considered advice because we know to give advice is a, uh, is a penalty, can be a penalty. And in this situation, information on distance or rules is not considered advice. So you may give informate that kind of information to your to another player or your opponent in match play. And I think one thing Clark mentioned to me when I had a question about this rule, um, it was that rule the rules of golf and a distance to a whole are known facts about the course. So you're not giving someone advice on their swing or what club they should use. You're just telling them, you know, maybe what's actually printed on the scorecard, you know, how far is this par three or the rules of golf are a known fact. That's a very good point, Allison. Uh, we'll move on to question eight here. Um, Clark, I have a yes. question. Sure. Um, so what about when your caddy like gives you advice on what club you should use is that when you would take a penalty or no no your caddy you can you can a player can get advice from his caddy his partner or his partner's caddy and those are the only people he can get advice from but it's okay for your caddy and that's that's a beautiful um relationship that we still have in golf at, at the high levels um the caddy player relationship. It's wonderful. Very good question. Thank you. Now this one, this is a kind of a, a gimme, right? This one right here. A score of six on a par four is called a bogey. And that's not true. Looks like you might have frozen. <laughs> okay. It's it's called a, a double bogey. Am I am I on again? Yeah, you're on again, and it looks like everyone got that question right. So great job, guys. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, we'll go to question nine here. Now, this says, out of bounds should be defined by white lines or stakes. And when you see that word should, it means that you don't really have to do it. Now, out of bounds, it says should. So when you, when you use the word should, it means that it, you don't actually have to. Uh, as a word, if it said must, then you would have to. But it, but we know it should be defined by white lines and stakes, and and most at every, at most every golf course it is. I have seen in my life, my long life, I have seen one golf course that decided to do it with, with blue stakes, but I never did figure out why they did that. So it should be that's a true state. All right, and then our last question. This was another one that uh, people frequently got wrong. Well, okay, what are the five parts of the golf course? Before the rules changed, you know, we, we changed the rules a bit two years ago. There were four parts of the golf course. Now there are five parts of the golf course. And uh, those parts are the teeing area, uh, the putting green, the uh, uh, penalty areas, and bunker. The golf course is called the general area. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm awfully sorry for this. I, I'm at a place where we should have a very good Wi-Fi. And I don't understand why this is happening. But um, so yes, the general, and the general area is all parts, all, all parts of the golf course, except uh, the teeing area of the hole you're playing and the putting green of the hole you're playing, penalty areas and bunkers. 
Okay. Awesome. So that concludes our quiz there. Hey, I'm going to ask my question. I did have yeah, a question. Go ahead. Yeah, my name's, my name's Charles. I'm here with my daughter, Tara. And the first question involved the loose impediment being stuck to the ball. Of course, I'm assuming unless the rules have changed, if it's a loose impediment that's not stuck to the ball, you certainly could move it. Would there be a penalty if the ball moved as you move the loose impediment? Yes, there would. And we're going to, I think we're going to discuss that in, in the penalty situations. Yes, there would. Thank you. I'll keep going. And we're going to talk about, all right, so we're going to give a, have a definition of a penalty area. That's going to be coming up. That young lady asked about a penalty area before. We're going to talk about what your options are for when your ball goes in there, what you can do. There we go. I'm going to try to get to, uh, to where he was. And I think we're in pretty good shape here now, right? Yeah, that so looks I'm good. Gonna, I think I might do a little review here since we're, I'll do it quickly, but I think we ought to review it because it was kind of, we were a bit, uh, let's just go through the definition of a penalty here. We talked about seas, lakes, ponds, rivers, which what that's what we kind of, that's very common and what we see. We also, in the new rules in 2019, uh, golf courses can, and committees can make penalty areas out of uh, areas of high grass, trees, dense areas where you might lose your ball. Committees might mark that with a red line or a yellow line. Uh, there's two types, yellow, which gives you two options. Red gives you three options. And, uh, and that's going to be the key. You've got to know when your ball goes into a penalty area, you've got to figure out where did it last cross the edge of the penalty area. If it crossed where it's red, you got three options. Yellow, you have two options. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, again, the edge of the penalty area goes up and down. Remember, I talked about, I know you got a lot of baseball fans out there. Think of the green monster at Fenway Park. So if you have a red line on the ground, just imagine a red monster going straight up in the air, up and down, and it goes into infinity. So like I said, if the ball is suspended up in a tree and it's inside the penalty area, it's in the penalty area. So I think we talked about that before. Um, we're going to define these normally with stakes and lines. Sometimes if there's not lines on the ground, clubs will just use stakes. And then you would just go from stake to stake um, to, just to see if your ball is in. We know that a ball, if any part of a ball is touching the penalty area, it's in the penalty area. So if your ball is on the ground and it's touching a yellow or red line, if any part of it's touching it, it is in the penalty area. And that's important to know. So when you hit your ball in a penalty area, you can either play it as it lies or you can take penalty relief outside of the penalty area. And if your ball's not found, Clark talked about this. We have this uh, term called knowledge or virtual certainty. And all that really means is in order to treat a ball as in a penalty area, you have to be 95% sure. Uh, if the ball could be anywhere else, let's say a ball hits a tree or there's high grass near where this penalty area is outside the penalty area, well, we have to know that it's in the penalty area to be able to use this rule. If we don't have this knowledge or virtual certainty, uh, then you would have to treat the ball as lost if you don't find it within three minutes. So let's talk now. Here we go, our relief. Uh, we have a ball, in this case here, we have a, a yellow penalty area and the ball, let me get my pointer out here because this is great. I can, I can, I like to, my laser pointer here. So right here, the ball goes in right here. X marks the spot. That's where it last crossed the edge of this yellow penalty area. My first option is I can go back and play from where I played the previous stroke with a penalty stroke. And my second option we're going to call this back on the line relief where you would take this reference point and the flag stick and go back on this dotted line and you can go back as far as you want for a penalty stroke. 
you will notice that in both of these cases, you have a one club length relief area in which you must drop the ball. So you're going to pick this reference point on the line here, and you've got your one club length. Just think of it like a piece of pie. It's a half a pie, and the ball, you have to drop it inside this one club length, and it must stay in the one club length. If you drop it and it rolls outside, you're going to have to redrop it. Okay. Hey, Tom, one so, thing that I think may be helpful for a lot of the juniors, too, is kind of explaining that one club length, because I think sometimes there's some confusion. They don't understand that pie, like you said. You really do have, you know, a wedge to drop within. It's not just a line you have to drop on. Yeah, so you, that's, a good, that's a great point. So you hit your ball, it goes in right here. You come back here, you put a T in the ground right here, and then you're going to use uh, you're, you're measuring with the longest club in your bag, except your putter. Most cases for most of us, it's going to be your driver. And you're going to measure a driver this way, a driver this way, a driver in every direction. Just think of a, this, this half, half a circle right here. And then this shaded area, that's going to be your relief area, your penalty relief area where you must drop the golf ball. Same thing back here. This shot was played from the general area. The only time this changes a little bit is let's suppose you hit it from the teeing area and you hit it into a penalty area. Well, then you can play from anywhere within the teeing area. Forget this one club link for that option. If you're going back to the, if you played from the teeing area, you can tee the ball up and you can play from anywhere within the teeing area in that case. Okay. Now, this back on the line relief, um, again, we're going to go back on this straight line. Uh, right there's our reference point, and we've got our one club length relief area where we must drop the ball. Keep in mind this point where it last crossed the edge. This ball, let's suppose the ball landed on the green, and you had a lot of spin on it, and it went, came back into the penalty area. Remember, it's where it last crossed, because the ball could cross here, cross here, go to the green and come back in and enter here. But where it last crossed is going to be your reference point. So that's a key thing to remember. When it's yellow, you can, in this case here, if it last crossed right here, it spun back in, you could not drop the ball on the green side of this yellow penalty area. You've got to keep that penalty area between you and the hole. I think everybody knows that. When it's marked yellow, when it's marked yellow, we'll talk about red in just a moment. Okay, and there we go. There's our back on the line relief area. We've got one club length, not near the hole. And this can be in any part of the golf course, except the same penalty area, your reference point. All right, now let's talk about red. Uh, and the two options we just went through when it was yellow, you have those same two options when it's red. And in a moment, we'll talk about an additional third option. So a player plays from the teeing area. They hit it into the penalty area. It's marked red. So here's where it last crossed. So all of these options are with a penalty stroke. They can go back to the teeing area. And like I mentioned, they can play anywhere within the teeing area, and they can tee it up if they want with a penalty stroke. They can choose back on the line relief. Again, here's the flag stick. Go back on this line, keeping that point between you and the flag stick. Go back as far as you want, put a T down to mark your reference point on the line, and then you have a one club length uh, in radius piece of pie in which you're dropping the ball. And then when it, and that's the same as yellow, when it's red, your third option is to drop the, what we call lateral relief. In this case, you're going to, where this reference point is, where it last crossed the edge you now are going to, can drop the ball within two club lengths. So you can come out sideways this way and measure your two club length uh, piece of pie in this case here. If you were watching the match play championship last weekend, there was even a case where a player got to drop the ball on the putting green. This is one rule where if the, if where it last crossed the edge, if it was right next to the putting green and two club lengths got you to the putting green, guess what folks? You can drop it on the putting green. 
So here's our two club length option. All of these are for penalty of one stroke. So okay. what if the hazard is, is not designated with a stake, right? I've seen courses where there's water and it looks like it should be a red penalty area, but it doesn't have a red stake. H how would you treat that? Okay. Um, the question, uh, so the question is, what, what are there, is there a line on the ground or is it just, there's no markings at all? No markings at all. And it looked just like that picture. There was water, okay. there was no markings. I'm going to go back here. Well, here's the good news is in the, in the, in the new rules in 2019, it's covered and it basically says that if this were not marked with anything, it defaults to red. It defaults to a red penalty area and it gets a little bit dicey when you're trying to determine where the edge is and it would be where the ground naturally slopes down. It's a very awkward situation because the golf course should always be marked. But if it was not marked with anything, the new rules right in the, in the book now, it says you're going to default to red and you'd have these three options with a penalty stroke. And just a note to add in there for you, um, you know, sometimes, like you said, we do end up at courses that may not may not be marked very well. Um, and so something that is important is to listen to the local rules for the day that you hear on the first tee, because a lot of times um, the committee will make a decision to consider any penalty areas that are not marked as a red penalty area. Um, and so this will include, you know, any bodies of water or um, wooded areas such as that. Um, but it's really important, especially, you know, the day of, you know, we tell you those announcements and local rules for the day on that first tee, because it's important, you know, if there's nothing marked out there and you don't hear it, you know, then you're maybe not sure what to do. Um, but a lot of times if we don't see anything marked, we will make a note to, you know, let everyone know that these areas will be played as a red penalty area. Okay. And the good news is I, th I believe uh, next week in the second program, uh, Clarkie is going to go through how to play a second ball properly. So that way, if you have any question or doubt while you're playing in your round in a stroke play event, not in match play, only in stroke play, you can play a second ball and then go tell the committee what you did. And, and that'll, that'll be a way to help you if you have a doubtful situation. Here is, this is going back to Emma's great question from earlier. It's a I called an Ivy League question because this can be a very confusing rule. So let's talk about this for a minute. Player hits from the teeing ground and they hit it right here to point A. And don't look at the words on the left right now. Just look at the pictures. So a player hits it to right here to A. And then they try to play it. They think they can hit it out of this area inside the penalty area. And they hit it up here to point B. All right, the rule now says this player has four options. They can go back under stroke and distance and drop it here and maybe have another go at it. Uh, if they don't want to, they don't have to. They can go back um, to, they can take back on the line relief. They can take lateral relief for two club lengths or this, we call it regression you can go back to where the last stroke was played from outside the penalty area. And that's the key here, folks. When you play, make a stroke from a penalty area and it stays in there, you can always go back to where your last stroke was played from outside the penalty area with a penalty stroke. So let's talk, let's just go through the numbers here for a moment. We'll count them all up. I make one stroke to here. I make two strokes to B. And now I can take one penalty stroke, which is now three, and I can drop the ball at any one of these locations, and this player would be hitting their fourth stroke. All right. Now, the one thing that's great about this rule is let's suppose you want to try to have another go at it, and you drop it here, and it rolls into three feet of water. <laughs> uh, but it stays within your one club length. Years ago, the game was over. If you couldn't play it, you, you had to go home. <laughs> but now, 
you can go back and take a, an additional penalty stroke and go back uh, under these options outside the penalty area. Very, this is a very high level rule and hopefully it doesn't happen to all of you, but there is an answer if, if it does. And I would be getting our, our field staff involved if this happens at a tournament, I would be calling a rules official to, um, uh, to help you out here because it's, it's complicated. Um, now, there are cases where your ball's inside a penalty area where you're not going to get relief. Uh, and that would be here you have a nice yellow line here. And this is the penalty area right here. And this ball is lying on this on top of the wall. So when we say abnormal course condition, what we're talking about here are animal holes, immovable obstructions, ground under repair, uh, and so forth. So in this case here, there is no relief when your ball lies inside a penalty area for an abnormal course condition, or if your ball is embedded in a penalty area, there's no relief. And again, you're not entitled to, to take an unplayable ball when your ball's in a penalty area. The rule you're going to use is the one we just covered, Rule 17. And the key is, where does the ball lie? That's the trick. If the ball's in the penalty area, in these cases here, there is no relief. And I think we have real, we spent a lot of time on that, which is good. But again, I think the main thing, if you understand yellow, two options, red, you have a, a one additional option of that two club length lateral relief and uh, that's important. Let's talk now about stroke and distance or if you lose your ball if it's out of bounds and then the provisional ball is really important for everybody because it can save time when you're out there playing. So we're going to talk about the definition of loss and out of bounds, stroke and distance relief and then what happens uh, if your ball is lost or out of bounds. You must take it and then provisional ball. So here we go. These changes were in 2019. Obviously, we now have three minutes to find an identifier ball. Uh, you can play a provisional ball, uh, even if you've gone forward to search for it. So if you went forward, search for a minute, and you want to go back and play a provisional, you can do that. When we get to that, I'll tell you why you should finish looking for your ball for two more minutes before you do it. Um, why waste that time going back? You should try to find your ball. You've got three minutes. So let's, let's, we'll talk about that when we get there. And uh, we'll talk more about provisional ball when we get there too. So when is a ball lost? That's when you're the player, your caddy, if you have a caddy, your partner or your partner's caddy has begun to search for your ball. So once any of those people get to the area where you you think your ball is and they start to search, the clock begins and it's three minutes and it goes by quick. So you got to really, uh, uh, you know, again, once, once you get there, you got three minutes to find it. Sometimes your time, you can get interrupted, not very often. Uh, but let's suppose, let's suppose you play a wrong ball. You look for a ball, you find a ball you think is yours. Let's say you look for a minute and then you play this ball and then you realize when you get up on the green, it's a wrong ball. Well, now you will, you have to go back and rectify your mistake under that rule. Uh, and you would now have two additional minutes to find your original ball. So again, three minutes is the key thing here, folks. I wouldn't get bogged down in a lot of details. This is a great illustration here. Again, let's look at the pictures here. When is a ball in or out of bounds? And then we're gonna go back to the Fenway Park and the Green Monster because boundaries go up and down. They go both up and down. So when we, when we use stakes right here, and let's look at these balls. This is the golf course, this is off the course. This ball's in bounds. This ball, if any part of the ball is touching the golf course or on the golf course, the ball is in bounds. And we're gonna use the inside edge of these stakes at ground level. If this were a fence, we would use the fence posts at ground level. And again, we would take a string and go from stake to stake. And if any part of this ball 
is on the golf course side, the ball is in bounds. Another way to think about it is in these cases right here, all of the ball is out of bounds. So therefore, those balls would be out of bounds and you would have to go back and play under stroke and distance. Sometimes, you don't see it very often, committees might use a white line on the ground for out of bounds. And we're going to, again, the line itself would be out of bounds if any part of the ball is touching the golf course side. So right here, that's our, our edge right there, golf course edge. If any part of that ball is touching the course, it's in bounds. This ball here, this is interesting. It's on the line, but none of it is touching the course. Therefore, that ball would be out of bounds. And of course, this one's out of bounds too. All right. Good stuff there. All right. One thing to know is at any time, any time, you can go back to where you played your previous stroke. We call this stroke and distance and take a penalty stroke. You can go back to where you played the previous stroke. Several years ago at the Masters on the 13th hole, Tiger Woods played from the putting green and he putted his ball into the penalty area. And he decided to take stroke and distance. And he went back to where he played the previous stroke from the putting green and placed it and played again from there. And that would be okay. You can always go back to where you played the previous stroke and take a penalty stroke under stroke and distance. All right, when your ball's lost or out of bounds, uh, your only option is to go back under stroke and distance. Uh, you, you, you must do so. So again, lost ball, not found within three minutes. The player obviously, must, if, if your ball is found, you've got to identify it within a reasonable amount of time. But if it isn't found within three minutes, then you've got to go back under stroke and distance. Same thing if your ball comes to rest out of bounds. Pretty straightforward. Again, you must take stroke and distance. And of course, in these cases, um, now we, we do have an exception here. So you, let's say you didn't find your ball in three minutes. And the reason why you didn't find it was because it was in a penalty area or Let's suppose a uh, dog picked it up and ran away with it. Um, and you knew that before the three minutes was up. Well, in those cases, we would, we would use the penalty area rule for the ball that was in the penalty area. Under this rule here, we would estimate where the ball was, where the dog picked it up and ran away, and we would put it in play there. But there are exceptions. The main thing, though, if it's lost or out of bounds, you must take stroke and distance relief. Don't be confused. There is that local rule that clubs must, they have to adopt it for it to be in effect, where if you hit the ball out of bounds, where you can drop up in the fairway, where the ball, where you think it went out of bounds and you take two penalty strokes, that's a model local rule that's only in effect if the committee says so. Otherwise, you must go back if you don't find it, uh, or it's out, and you must go back to where you played the previous stroke. And for Philadelphia uh, Junior Tour events, we do not adopt that local rule. So just so you guys know, that rule is not in effect for any of our events. Perfect. That's perfect. So, um, so if you're just playing golf for fun back at your club with mom and dad and doing your thing, um, Sometimes that can be used, but in our competitions, when you're playing competitive golf. Uh, normally, just like our, our uh, junior tour, it would not be in effect. All right. So we've heard this term provisional ball. And when can you play a provisional ball? And basically, you can play a provisional ball if you think your ball may be lost outside a penalty area or out of bounds. So you hit your ball towards a fence that's out of bounds. You're not sure if it's in or out. Well, to save time, you can go play another a provisional ball um, uh, under penalty of straight distance. And we'll talk about that in just a moment here. Now, in order to get the benefit of this rule, you have to announce what you're doing. 
you have to announce that you're playing a provisional ball to anyone in the group, anyone that's there in your, in your pairing at an event, you have to just say, I'm going to play a provisional ball because I think my ball might be out of bounds. Um, somebody has got to put their, they've got to mute your, your microphone, please. We've got a lot of background noise. Um, so again, this player must, must use the word provisional. So when you're playing in our junior tour events or any other competitions, please use the word provisional and you tell anybody in your group what you're doing so that there's no doubt. Now I got a question for everybody. Look at the way this gal's dropping the ball. Is that a good drop everybody? I don't think so because guess what? This picture was taken before 2019. We're dropping from knee height now. Remember our dropping technique to have a, a, a good drop, you're dropping from knee height. So we're gonna have to change that picture. <laughs> All right. So again, and you can play a provisional, let's say, so here we are, I tee off and I hit my, and I hit a big old hook over into the trees over here. I think it might be lost outside of water, a penalty area or out of bounds. And now I announce I'm going to hit a provisional ball. Now this ball traveled about 225 yards. When I hit my provisional ball, I only hit it about a hundred yards. I got really nervous and I popped up right to here. So this rule now, when you play, you can hit this provisional ball more than once and it's still not in play. It's still a provisional ball. So I played the ball from point A to point B. It's still a provisional ball at this point. That's okay. So you would play this ball to point B and then go look for your original ball. If you want to, you don't have to go look for it. Um, you can make a stroke at this ball from point B and then that would become your ball in play. But if somebody finds this ball before you do that, you've got to go over and identify. But most cases, we're going to play this provisional ball, hit it again to B and then go look for our original ball and hopefully we can find it within three minutes. All right, so when does the provisional ball become the ball in play? Uh, and that is when the original is lost. So if you don't find this within three minutes, be, this ball now becomes your ball in play. The other time that this becomes the ball in play is let's suppose I don't go look for this and I just walk up to point B and I make a stroke at this ball from a spot that's nearer the hole than where my original ball is estimated to be. Well, then now this ball becomes my ball in play under stroke and distance. So let's just count them up here for a minute. I hit my original ball here, that's one. I play a provisional ball. So I've taken a penalty stroke, provisional ball, which lies three, hit my stroke here four. And then if I don't find this ball or I make a stroke at this, this is my ball in play. Hey Thomas, I have a question for you. Let, let's, let me just go back. Let me just review one thing here with provisional ball for, for one moment. And this is really key, depending on what your experience is out there. The main thing, if you hit your ball, I always call it bad country. Trees, a boundary, high grass, lots of bad stuff. That's not a penalty area. And you want to play this provisional ball, just make sure you announce it as a provisional ball and then go ahead and play it. And then you can keep playing it until you get beyond where the original is likely to be. Then you got to go over and either try to find this or keep playing with this, pro this provisional ball uh, and it would become a ball in play. All right, go ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. I appreciate that. If, if you hit the original ball in the woods, you hit the provisional ball, you pop it up, say it's a par four because it looks like a par four to me. And the person you're playing with goes to look for your original ball while you're hitting the provisional ball A and you hit it in the hole for a four. And so you haven't gotten to the spot where the original ball was, but someone finds it. Can you still declare it lost? And I don't even want to go over there, leave me alone. Or once someone finds the ball, you can't, if you find the original ball, it's my understanding you can't play your provisional. So how would you handle that? All right, let's, this is a, there's a lot going on here. So let's, let's try to 
work our way through this. I go, I played, a, I played my provisional at point A. Yep. And my, the player, person I'm playing with is really trying to be helpful. And yep. they're up here. And before, and, and before I play this ball, they say, Hey, Tom, I think I've got your ball. Well, this player does not lose the right to play another stroke at this provisional ball because they have not identified this ball yet as theirs. So, and if they think about it this way, they wouldn't, we wouldn't make them walk up a hundred yards to see, cause this ball may not be theirs. Maybe this person is mistaken and then they would have to walk all the way back. So now this player could play from, from point a up to here in your case here, let's say they knock it in the hole yep. and now they got to walk over. It's, this ball was found within three minutes if this is their ball then this is their ball in play and this ball would be disregarded it would not count yeah and i, and I appreciate that explanation i think what i'm trying to get at is who do you have more control can a player that you're playing against take control of going to find your original ball thereby thereby nullifying a provisional ball especially if something good happens with it or can you just declare it lost before they have the opportunity to do that? Especially, I mean, in this case, it's different because the provisional ball is behind where the original ball is, which gives you more options than if the provisional ball was ahead of where the original ball was. Let, let's just, uh, like, you cannot declare a ball lost. There has to be, something has to happen for it to be lost, meaning you search for three minutes and you don't identify it as yours. Uh, or you put another ball into play, but you can't by statement after looking after a minute, say I'm declaring it lost, not the case. You can't stop somebody from looking for your ball. You can ask them to not look for it, but if they want to go look for it anyway, um, that's okay. Um, so I don't want to get too bogged down with this because we've got, okay. a, you know, a lot of levels of, of uh, knowledge here and, I think um, they, they, they've, these folks have my email address. Uh, I'd be more than happy to talk offline on this. I don't want to get too much in the weeds with this. The main yeah. thing to remember is you, can't, you cannot declare your ball lost. So in this case right here, this ball is found by someone else. You're still here, but you're still entitled to play this provisional ball up to here and then go try to identify it. If it's not yeah, your ball... That, that's oh, yeah, the I'm important sorry. part of it because the provisional ball is behind the original ball. That certainly can and does happen. I think the important point, especially for young golfers, is just because something good happens with a provisional ball, if the original ball is found, that provisional ball really is null and void. And I think sometimes that's hard for especially young golfers to get a hold of. Yeah, let's, let's, let's just, let me just tie this up with one last example. And maybe this will put it in, into perspective. I hit my ball in the bad country right here. And then I play my provisional ball and I hit it up to point B. Yep. And while I'm walking to my ball, my very helpful playing partner walks over and says, Hey, Tom, I've got your ball right over here. Well, once, if that ball's found and it's believed to be mine, I do have to go over and try to identify it. Mm -hmm. I can't disregard that. So I can't just walk up to B and play it. Now, let's just, let, let me, let me, let me, one last piece here. If I can get the ball B and play it before anybody finds this, then I'm okay to do that. And if yeah. I make a stroke at this ball here before anybody finds this, then this ball becomes my ball and play. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. That's a good point. Appreciate the explanation. You got it. All right. Ball unplayable. So now we've got rule 19. Um, and uh, again, the key part of this rule is like Emma was talking about earlier, you hit your ball into a bad place and you can't play it. What can I do? Well, we know we can take an unplayable anywhere on the course, except in a penalty area. Because when we're in a penalty area, red or yellow, we have rule 17, the penalty area rule, that takes care of that. So the unplayable ball is not an option when you're in a penalty area. It's only everywhere else you can. So we're going to talk about options when your ball's in the general area or the putting green. 
And then we're going to talk about a ball that's in a bunker. Let's say it's buried in the sand under the lip. And we'll talk about some options there. A little bit different when your ball's in the bunker. So let's move through and get, get us some pictures here. Um, I'm going to go up here right here. So here we go. So you, the player, are the only person that can decide if your ball's unplayable. That doesn't matter what other people think. You can, the player is, is the sole judge. We, we used that language before. And again, you can do this anywhere on the course except in a penalty area. So here we are. Here's a great visual. And again, I, I like pictures. I think over 60% of the people in the world are visual learners. I think I'm in that camp. So this player, uh, can, under stroke and distance, this player plays from here and they hit it into this bush right here. Bad country. Their one option is they can go back to where they played the previous stroke. And this would be a one club length relief area. Here's our reference point where the ball was estimated to be. And for a one penalty stroke, stroke and distance, we can always take stroke and distance. Remember that we can also take back on the line relief. Here's where the ball lies. Here's the flag stick. And we're going to go back on this line right here. Put a T in the ground for your reference point, and you've got a one club length and piece of pie, uh, in radius piece of pie. That's going to be your relief area. And again, anytime you're dropping a ball, folks, under any rule, you are always dropping it inside a one or two club length relief area. Most of the time, it's one. When we get into lateral relief, we have two. But when when you have these relief areas, you must we call it a right way drop. Knee height, drop it inside the relief area, and the ball must stay in the relief area. And that's the key thing. If it rolls outside the relief area, you're going to redrop it. So again, back on the line relief is our second option. And then our third option here, um, well, our third option would be lateral relief. And now we're going to take where the ball lies. It's not from the edge of the bushes or trees. It's where the ball lies. And you've got two club lengths and you've got a two club length in radius piece of pie. So when we say lateral relief, we talk about this third option under ball and playable. And then of course, a red penalty area, you have a two club length relief area as well. Everything else is one club length when you're dropping a golf ball. So we're going to find this ball right here and we've got a two club length area. Some cases, if the ball's in there deep enough, two club lengths may not get you out, out of the bushes or out of the trees. So you might want to consider back on the line relief or even stroke and distance. That's the key thing. Now, when our ball's in a bunker, um, Remember what we just covered. We've got stroke and distance. We've got back on the line and we've got lateral relief to club link. So let's talk about now player point A plays it and it buries in the sand under the lip and you can't play it. This player can take stroke and distance under one penalty stroke and come back to one. If they choose either of the other, these other two options, one pen stroke options, back on the line relief, the ball must be dropped in the bunker. If they choose lateral relief, two club lengths, uh, they must drop it in the bunker for one penalty stroke. And then added in 2019, if let's say you're not a real good bunker player and you're really worried you're not going to be able to get it out, you can take two penalty strokes and drop it back under this option four. And you know what, folks? That may be a good option for people who have trouble with bunkers. It's a real deep bunker with a high lip. And you think, geez, there's no way I'm going to be able to get this ball out. Well, I can go back and take two penalty strokes under option four. Most of the time, 99% of the time, people are choosing the normal one stroke penalty options, stroke and distance, back on the line relief, must be in the bunker, 
to club length uh, re uh, lateral relief must be in the bunker. So that's our ball and playable in a bunker. All right. Any questions on a ball unplayable? Or anything else for that matter? Oh, playing two balls. I have this in here. Okay, it looks like Emma may have uh, just raised her hand with a question. Okay. I have three Go different ahead, Emma. I have three different questions, but it's not on what we just talked about. So do you want me to wait? Why don't we wait just a moment? Because I want to make sure I cover this two playing two balls, if that's okay. okay. All right. Okay. So now we talk about situations and look at this picture here. This gal here, she hits her ball. This is Kathy Gordon from the USGA, one of the great people in the world from Atlanta, Georgia. And she hits her ball into this bare area. Rest of the fairway looks really good. This looks like it's uh, the, the committee. When they looked at this, maybe they missed it. Should this be ground under repair? Should she get relief from this area? She doesn't know. And there's nobody from the committee around. Nobody's out on the golf course. There's no one around. And the main thing, this has to be in stroke play only. And that's what you play in the junior tour events. You're playing stroke play. So this player uh, can use this rule and play two balls. Uh, so they're going to announce, she's going to announce, hey, I think I might be entitled to relief from this. She's going to announce uh, that she's going to play two balls and she is going to choose which ball she wants to score with. Now, in this case, most likely she's going to choose. She's going to say, if I'm entitled to relief from this area, I'm going to choose the ball that I drop after relief. And then she's going to play both these balls into the hole. And then what's really important, well, all of this is important, but you're going to make sure you put both balls into the hole, finish the hole, and then you must tell the committee what you did. You must report to the committee or you're disqualified. So if you're going to try to play two balls, again, stroke play only, make sure you announce that you're going to play a second ball. You're going to choose the ball that you want to score with, put both balls in the hole, and then tell the committee what you did. Now, someone might say, well, why do I have to choose? Isn't it obvious that Kathy wants to choose the ball dropped? Well, there are cases where you want to play this original ball. Let's suppose your ball was near a boundary and you couldn't tell if the ball was in or out of bounds for some reason. That's a case where you're going to want to play that ball if it's in bounds, and then you would play a second ball on your stroke and distance and then tell the committee what you did. So that's why it's important to choose which ball you want to score with. So once again, this is so important, whether you're playing in a junior tour event, a high school event, competition, uh, college event, if there's no one around, stroke play only, announce you're going to play a second ball, Choose which ball you want to score with. In this case here, Kathy's going to most likely say, you know what? I think I'm entitled to relief. I think the committee may have missed this. I'm going to take relief from it. And then I'm going to play both balls into the hole and then uh, tell the committee what you did. Make sure you do that because if you don't, you're going to be disqualified. So that's our key points here of playing two balls. This I'm one you want to write... You want Just to a reminder this for one. any juniors who don't know who the committee is, the committee is any rules officials on the course at the event that day. Yep. Yep. All right. So I think. Okay. Now, Emma, you said you had, you had some questions. Yes. 
Okay, fire away. Okay, so um, what's a provisional ball? Okay, provisional ball is when you hit your ball somewhere where you think it might be lost or out of bounds outside of a penalty area. So an example would be there's white stakes and you hit your ball in that direction and you think it might be out of bounds. Or let's say there's really high grass or lots of trees. Well, then what you would do is say, I'm going to hit a provisional ball and it's to save time. That way you don't walk all the way up Look for your ball for three minutes and then have to walk all the way back if you don't find it or if it's out of bounds and and play from where you made the previous stroke. It's really to save time, Emma. So when you do this, you can play a provisional ball and then go look for your original ball. OK, thank you. Um, You're welcome. I think there's somebody else who has a question. So would you like me to uh, wait for my other questions that I have? Uh, what, why don't we take the other question and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Uh, in the chat, Vivek asked a question about under bad fairway spots. Can I pick up the ball, clean it and put it back? <laughs> All right. So let's talk about one of the, one of the uh, principles of the, of golf for, well, longer than older than Clark and Clark, Mr. Lewis is, is pretty old. So forever and ever and ever, if you think of two couple things, play the course as you find it and play the ball as it lies. So if you hit your ball into a bare area and it's not marked as ground under repair, you have to play the ball as it lies. Now, again, in the example I gave with that picture, if it's a real bad area and you think that it should be marked as ground under repair and there's no officials anywhere, nobody in a golf cart who runs the tournament, you can choose to play two balls and then get a clarification from the committee. And again, if you did that, you would take relief, from, take, drop a, a second ball taking relief from where the ball is in the bare area and play that ball into the hole and then you would play the original ball as it lies and play that ball into the hole and then tell the committee what you did. So generally speaking, just because an area is not in great shape and it's a bare area, well, let's say it has a little bit of mud on it, you can't just pick it up and clean it unless a rule allows you to pick it up. And as someone who grew up playing golf as a kid, I grew up playing Cobbs Creek and Karakung in West Philadelphia. And I played Walnut Lane. I played a lot of public golf courses when I was young. And the public golf courses, obviously, they're not as in good shape as private country clubs. But I, I grew up playing municipal golf courses. And I just learned not to touch my ball unless a rule lets me pick it up. And something else that you may have seen in the last event you played was uh, a local rule for the day, lift clean in place in your own fairway. Uh, Tom, if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sometimes, let's say after after a lot, like especially in the spring, if you have lots of rain and the fairways are really soft and there's puddles of water and stuff like that, or or it could be, let's say, the in the spring, golf courses really haven't, the grass hasn't started to grow yet. Um, the committee might say that we're going to play preferred lies, uh, like Allison said, in, in your own fairway, and you're going to be able to mark the ball lift it, clean it, and place it within one club length uh, based on, on the model local rule and play from there. And your own, that's, that's in, a, in a, uh, an area cut to fairway height or less. Uh, so you couldn't do it in the rough or uh, again, a fairway height or less is the way the, the uh, local rule works. But all, that's because the, that local rule gives you permission to mark, lift, clean it, and put it back. If that's not in effect, you can't just pick your ball up and clean it off. And that rule will be announced on the first tee during our local rules. So if it's not announced on the first tee, that means you know we're playing the ball down, you play the ball as it lies. Yeah, you can never get in trouble if you play the course as you find it, play the ball as it lies, 
play it from the teeing area and don't touch it until you pick it out of the hole. You'll never be in trouble. All right, Emma, if we want to come back to um, a couple of your questions, I don't know. I didn't see anyone else uh, hand pop up. Um, I have more questions. Um, yeah, go ahead. Or, oh, okay. Um, so, like, is is a ball like in a penalty area? If it's next to a penalty area, or is like in between the stakes of the penalty area. Okay, so you might remember in one of the slides in the pictures. If you have two stakes and you would think of the golf course side, like the fairway side, let's say, and if you took a string from stake to stake, that would, that would determine the edge of the penalty area. So if any part of your ball was touching the penalty area, it would be in the penalty area. Now, the good news is in our world today of rules with the changes, you can do everything in a penalty area that you can do in the fairway. You can move loose impediments. You can ground your club. You can take practice wings in these penalty areas, which is way different than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, the main thing is you got to make sure you don't cause your ball to move. And then the other piece to that is if it's in the penalty area, you would use that rule to take a penalty stroke and drop it out of the penalty area. If it's outside the penalty area, then you got to play it as it lies, or you have the unplayable ball option uh, to get your ball back in play. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hey Thomas, can you ground your club in a penalty area then? You can't ground your club, can you? Yes, you can. Oh my That's goodness. part of the new 2019 changes. Now, you, now you. don't don't confuse it. Remember when we prior to 19 bunkers and 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 we call them then water hazards were all hazards. 2019 we separated the two, and you've got penalty areas and you've got bunkers. Got so it. in penalty areas you can ground your club, move loose impediments, take practice swings, no problem. In a bunker, you still got to be careful because there are some restrictions when your ball's in the bunker like touching the sand on your backswing. You can't take practice swings in the bunker and you can't touch the sand immediately in front of or behind your ball. Uh, so there are still some restrictions in a bunker. Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any questions before we kind of wrap up here? All right. So I think next week, Clarky, uh, help me out here. You, you chime in. I believe next week the presentation is going to cover uh, abnormal course conditions, taking relief from, from cart paths and, and, and ground under repair and things like that. That's right. Well, what the, else you got uh, on the docket? Well, we're going to, we're going to talk, well, we're going to go over again. We're going to, I think it's important to go over what uh, you, you des described it so well playing two balls that that can never be stressed enough and i know that it happens a lot in this in the form of play that these young folks uh, uh do um so we'll, we'll go over that again we'll go over all the things you, these are all the places where you're going to get it, your your ball is in a, in a in a place that you might not like where it is and you're going to be able to take it away without having to pay a penalty stroke for example when you're on a cart path or something's in the, a, a man-made thing is in your backswing uh we're going to discuss all those times when you don't have to pay a penalty and you get relief. That's called free relief, as opposed to today, which was penalty relief. And it looks like Emma may have uh, posted another question about uh, abnormal course conditions with Clark. Correct me if I'm wrong. That will be covered in next week's session. That's true. OK, that we will. Well, we'll, we will be glad to answer the question if you like. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Emma? 
Did she type type it in or is it? Yeah, uh, she typed it under the Q&A portion, but Emma, if you want to just go ahead and ask the question. Okay, um, so one of the things um, on the presentation was an interference by an abnormal course condition. Um, mm -hmm. What is an abnormal course condition? All right, now we could give you some homework, but you know what? You <laughs> probably have enough homework at school, so we're going to answer it for you. But there, it's a great definition that's in the rule book. And an abnormal course condition is one of these things. It could be ground under repair, which normally would be a white line on the ground. It could be an animal hole made by any animal, like a gopher uh, or a, a rabbit, uh, any, a, a burrowing animal hole. Uh, an animal hole, I should say, not burrowing, an animal hole. It also could be temporary water, which we used to call casual water. Now it's called temporary water, which would be after a rainstorm and you've got puddles in the fairway, those would be, that's temporary water. You can't have that in a, in a penalty area. You can only have that in, in, in other parts of the course. And then the last part would be what we call immovable obstructions, which are artificial objects that you can't move, like sprinkler heads, cart paths, uh, et cetera. So that's what the definition of an abnormal course condition. And those are things that you get, like Clark mentioned, free relief from. Except when your ball's in a penalty area. If your ball's in a penalty area, you don't get relief. Okay, thank you. Um, I I uh I did have another question. <laughs> um, sorry. Now, Emma, let me ask you: Is 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 mom and dad? Is someone giving you all these questions, or are you thinking of all these yourself? Um, I just have them. <laughs> Good. That's okay. Good. Um, so this is kind of like what I was trying to ask earlier. Um. But like, if your ball is in a penalty area and you like hit it out of the penalty area, but you don't like where it landed, can you yep. take um, a penalty relief? Well, I'll say, so you hit a ball from, from this, you're inside a pond and you can play it and you hit it and it goes out of the outside the penalty area and it goes into the bushes. Well, you have and, and you wanted to, and now because the ball is no longer in the penalty area, you can use the ball unplayable rule to take penalty relief. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I promise next week that I'm going to uh, take my computer to the highest point in the Poconos <laughs> to, to try to avoid this glitch that we had today i really profoundly apologize for that i must have been very well, I, hope, uh, I hope so too Clarky, because if you can't do it next week then i'm going to have to sing at the beginning of the program and i don't <laughs> think anybody on this call wants to hear me sing well, i don't know I, I think all right well go ahead i, sorry, I just hope i just hope everybody enjoyed it and if you can it was informative to you and and don't forget uh, you can call us at any time uh, if you have a rules question. Um, uh, my, uh, you can find my telephone number in the, uh, and Tom's in the, in the uh, section directories and, uh, and call us at any time. Call Valley Country Club for me. And you can also reach out to um, our info at Philly Junior Tour email, and we can get you there in contact information as well if you're searching for it. Um, yeah, but thank I, you I all so much. I would send your, I would, I would get in touch with Allison or Brian at the, any of the folks at the office. And again, if, if you want to, uh, I think the best thing to do would be to email, send an email. If you have any other questions, that would be an easier thing, perhaps with some more detail, but uh, we're glad to help. Absolutely. So thank you all so much for joining us this week. As a reminder, session two is going to be next Tuesday on April 6th, same time from 530 to 7. Uh, we hope that you'll all join and um, Clark will get his Wi-Fi figured out by then. So uh, thank you again all for joining. And again, if you have any questions, please email our info box.
um, and we will get back to you. All right. Thanks again. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. You say thank you. Thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. You're welcome.